So behind me is a beautiful image of a molecule called Buckminster Fullerene, or C60, or a buckyball. It was discovered by Harry Croto and colleagues in 1985, and it led to the 1996 Nobel Prize in chemistry. In 1990, we developed a, a way here at Sussex of actually making it in large quantities. Now, if you look at the structure, you probably recognize it. It's like a football. Uh, it, it dissolves in solvents such as toluene and benzene to, be, to produce beautiful colored solutions, this ex exquisite sort of magenta color that you can see here. Now, if we look at the structure, we see that it's made of pentagon rings and hexagon rings. There are actually 12 pentagon rings in the football structure. It's not obvious, but actually each pentagon is isolated by a bond from the other pentagons to produce this beautiful symmetrical structure. As each pentagon's got five atoms, and there are 12 pentagons, 12 times five is 60, so there's actually 60 atoms in this beautiful structure. There are single and double bonds. The double bonds try and keep away from the pentagons. So the single bonds are in the pentagons, the double bonds are between the pentagons, between the two uh, hexagons here. Uh, so this is the structure. It looks like a sphere, doesn't it? But actually, if it was a, a billiard ball and perfectly symmetrical, it would be a sphere. But actually, the mathematical name for this strange thing, although we know it as a soccer ball, is actually a truncated icosahedron. If you look at the picture behind me here, uh, this is an icosahedron. It's made of 20 triangles. It's got 12 corners. Now, if we cut off a corner, which mathematicians call truncating, you'll end up, you see, because there's five edges coming to each corner, you'd end up with a pentagon if you cut that off. And if you go around the other 12 corners on the icosahedron, you'd actually cut off 12 corners, and you'd end up with 12 pentagons left behind and 20 hexagons as well. So the actual mathematical name of a soccer ball and the C60 molecule is this truncated icosahedron. So it's all very well me coming along saying it's got this structure, but how do we know? How do we know the buckyball of the C60 molecule has actually got this structure? And the way that scientists determine the structure of things is using spectroscopy. So, for example, there, there are many different types of spectroscopy. Uh, X-rays is a brilliant way of working out the structure of things, mass spectrometry, neutron scattering, UV visible spectra, the way the molecule absorbs the light, the way the molecule absorbs in the infrared, and nuclear magnetic resonance. And we're going to look at some of these today to prove that we know the structure of this thing. So let's start off with mass spectrometry. Now, you can, there is a machine called a mass spectrometer where you can put a substance in it and it will weigh the molecule. So, uh, in principle, if you put a molecule in it, it will weigh it in terms of kilograms, but no one ever does it that way because the numbers are so small, of course. Everything is related to the, the hydrogen atom. So what we do is we say the hydrogen atom is one unit, one atomic mass unit, and everything else is related to that. So a carbon atom is 12 times the mass of a hydrogen atom. So if you had a 60-atom molecule made of carbon, how much would it weigh? Well, you could work it out. It should be 60 times 12. That's 720 times a hydrogen atom. So if you can put the molecule in a mass spectrometer, it gives you a lot of information for how much this thing weighs, the mass of the molecule. C70 is another cage. It's a bit like a rugby ball. So that would have a mass of 70 times 12, which is 840 mass units. So if you could make this substance and put it in a mass spectrometer, you could get a lot of information about whether, you know, what, what the structure of this thing is. So this is behind me is a spectra of the raw material that we make when we make C60. And right at the centre here, you see this enormous peak for C70 corresponding to 720 mass units. So that's in the right place. We also see uh, C70 over here, and actually there are other stuff in it, but we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, the interesting thing about carbon is that Although 99% of the carbon in our body and everywhere is carbon-12, in other words, if you could look at it, it's got six protons and six neutrons, about 1% of all the carbon in the world is carbon-13. So that has an extra neutron, so it's six protons and seven neutrons. And so if you had a 100-atom molecule, because there's 1% chance of having the carbon-13, you'd expect at least one of the atoms actually to be carbon-13. C60, of course, is not 100, it's 60, so it's slightly less. Uh, and actually, if you look at the spectra, you'll see that these aren't super sharp lines. they are actually got a thickness, and that's due to these isotopes, the carbon-13 isotope. So um, let me just go. You can actually use, uh, if you go back to your A-level maths, there's a thing called the binomial theorem, and you can use this formula to work out um, the probability of there being a pure carbon-12 C60 or carbon-60 with 59 carbon-12s and one carbon-13 
or a C60 molecule of 58 carbon 12s and two carbon 13s. And th this uh, formula will give you uh, the quantities, the natural occurring quantities. And if you do that, you can draw up a table. And actually, when you look at the, the theoretical distribution of these different molecules, so here's a pure C60 with just carbon 12. Here's a C61 carbon 13. And then over here is a, a C60 with two carbon 13s. It matches up perfectly with what you get when you see the, the, the sample put into a real mass spectrometer. Um, you also see something else interesting. Over here, you see a peak for what looks like it should be carbon 30. Is there a cage for carbon 30? No, that there isn't. And what happens is that the spectrometer actually measures the mass over the charge. So it actually measures that fraction. Now, usually the molecules are just singly charged. So they've either got an electron on them or they've knocked an electron out. So that, that you need it to be charged for the mass spectrometer to pick it up. So the C60 molecule, just a single charge, pops up here at 720. But if it happens to have two charges, then it's 720 divided by 2, 360, and that's why you get these peaks. So it's very interesting. The molecule loves having charges on it. You can see uh, a doubly charged C60, and you can see triply charged C60 over here. So that's the doubly charged things, uh, and explains these other peaks. Uh, there's actually a whole family of fullerenes in here. If you look at this spectra, it's a beautifully complex spectra. We've got C60 here, nice and strong. This is C70 at 840 mass units, and actually in weaker signals here, you can see a whole family of different cages, all with different structures and shapes. They all actually have 12 pentagons, but they have a different number of hexagons and obviously a different number of atoms. So the mass spectrometry gives us an idea of how much the thing weighs, but it doesn't really tell us much about the actual shape of the thing. From the isotope peaks, we know that there's tons of carbon in it. If it was a C10 molecule with other atoms on, we wouldn't see such a strong isotope peak. So we know it's pretty pure carbon, but that's really what it, all it shows us. So we need another technique to investigate the structure uh, a bit more. And infrared spectro uh, spectrometry can do this for us. If we take a molecule, what happens is if you take this C60 molecule, for example, at any one time, having a little bit of thermal energy, all the atoms are jiggling around and vibrating. And you can imagine the 60 atoms here, they can all be moving up, across, or towards you. So each atom, if you like, has three degrees of freedom. So if you have a 60 atom molecule, there are three times 60 ways that the atoms can all be jiggling around with its thermal energy. And some of these will actually absorb, not in the visible, but in the infrared. So working out the number of vibrations that correspond to what can be absorbed in the infrared is a very good way of working out the structure. And there's a thing called group theory, a mathematical technique, which you can apply to the shapes and the structures to work out how many infrared modes or absorptions you should have. So I've got here three models. They each have 60 carbon atoms, so they could each be a candidate for C60. Only one of them is the real one. Behind me here, you'll see this is a 60-atom sheet. It's a flat sheet, so it's like a bit of graphite or graphene. And it's all hexagons. This has got 60 carbon atoms. If you can make this molecule, you can work out from the group theory that only 25 of the motions will absorb in the infrared. So if you can make this molecule and put it in an infrared spectrometer, you'd expect to see 25 bands. Um, the next molecule is this. This looks a little bit like a buckyball, but actually if I show it side on, um, I think you can see it's, it's not round. It's got a sort of like a pincushion shape. And here, instead of all the pentagons being isolated, the pentagons are in pairs. I don't know whether you can see that. So this isn't the soccer ball version, but it's got 60 atoms. And if you go through the group theory on this shape, you'll see actually that this should have 22 infrared absorptions. So if you could make this molecule, it would have 22 absorptions. And finally, if we go to the soccer ball uh, uh, molecule, because of this beautiful symmetry, because all the pentagons are isolated, it turns out that for a 60-atom molecule, this has an unbelievably few number of absorptions in the infrared. It only has four. So if you could make this molecule and put it in an infrared spectrometer and you could measure the four absorptions, it would be a pretty good sh um, indication that you've got the round soccer ball molecule. And that's exactly what you see. If you see on the spectra behind me here, this is from the raw material that we produced to make the fullerenes. There's a scattering here due to just the particles in the film, but actually if you close up, you can see four little infrared bands. And so infrared spectroscopy actually was crucial for the search of making C60. The mass spec was important, but the mass spec didn't really give you an idea of the structure. 
but the infrared does. Because if you saw 22 bands, it wouldn't be the football structure. If you see four bands, it's a good indication it's this beautiful football structure. And that's exactly what you see here. This is a spectrum of the purified molecule without the other fullerenes and cages in. And you see the four bands here very beautifully marked. Uh, so it's, a, it's another indicator that it's a, a molecule with 60 atoms and also it's a molecule with, with the right shape that we're looking for. Let's talk about UV spectroscopy. It turns out if you look at a molecule, uh, there's 60 atoms in here. Each carbon atom, of course, has got six electrons, but most of them are embedded within the atom. It's only the outer electrons that interact with the world and give us the chemistry. So if you look at these outer electrons on the molecule, you find that they all stack up in bands of energy, which you can see behind me here. This is called the Huckel energy spectrum or energy level diagram. And for the fullerenes, um, you can see it here, the, for the fullerenes, all the bands fill up to a level, and then there's a gap. So one of the stabilities for the carbon cage is, is it's called a closed cage molecule. So all the electrons fill up to a level, and then there's a gap here until it can fill up to another level. That gap is too big to absorb in the visible. So what happens is if a visible light beam falls on the molecule, there's not enough energy in that light to promote one of these electrons to the next band. It's only ultraviolet that can do that. So if you make a solution of C60, it actually should be transparent, like water. But it isn't. And the reason why it's got a bit of color, and it's got a beautiful color, it's a sort of magenta color, is that at any one time, the molecule is vibrating with all these vibrations due to the thermal energy. And that actually breaks the symmetry of the molecule. So it's never a perfect buckyball. It's always slightly egg-shaped or whatever. And that breaking of the symmetry gives you a little bit of color. And that results in the thing having a slight color in the visible. But most of the uh, transitions in the C60 molecule are in the ultraviolet. So this is actually a spectrum, but we can look at this in more detail in, in the literature. If you do a Google search, you can look up all these things. Finally, I want to talk about the nuclear magnetic resonance. Now, um, it turns out that normal carbon-12 isn't what's called a, um, a magnetic nuclei. So if you put it in a magnetic field, it just sits there. But the carbon-13 is magnetic. And what that means is if you put this in a magnetic field, the atoms can be in two different energy states. And if you apply radiation to the molecule, you can make the uh, nucleus jump those energy states. What that means is if you put a sample of this in a nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometer in a strong magnetic field, it will absorb radiation. It turns out it absorbs in the radio spectrum about the same frequencies as a television band for the strong magnets we can make. Sounds very complicated, but actually it's beautifully simple. What the carbon-13 NMR tells us is how many different types of carbon atom there are in the structure. And in C60, because every atom is equivalent to every other atom, there's only one type of atom in this structure. So if you put this molecule in a spectrometer, you get the most beautiful one-line NMR spectrum. And there's no real structure apart from a massive 60-atom ring, which will probably give a one-line NMR spectrum. So that's good evidence that it's a round cage with this beautiful symmetry. But the real clincher is C70. Let me show you C70. C70 is like a rugby ball. And um, so rather than, it looks a bit round here, but if I put it on its side, I think you can see that it's definitely not round. It's like a rugby ball shape. And it turns out there are five different types of atom in the C60, C70 molecule. These ones at the end are equivalent. The ones in the middle are all equivalent. And there's actually three other types of atom. So if you put this in an NMR spectrometer, instead of one line, because there are five different types of uh, nuclei, you should get five resonances. And because there are 10 of these type at the ends, 10 in the middle, but the 20 of these type, 10 of these type, and 20 of these type, not only should you get a five-line spectrum, but it should be in the ratio of 1 to 2 to 1 to 2 to 1. And that's exactly what you see. If you look at the spectrum, here's the side view showing the molecules. If you take a spectrum of pure C60, you see five bands. On the, on the, uh, this big peak here is the benzene molecule, but these, that peak here, this little one here, corresponds to the most unstrained uh, nuclei, which are a bit like benzene, so they're near benzene. And the other atoms are shown by the other peaks. So not only have you got a one-line spectrum for C60, which would either have to be a cage or a round loop, but now with C70, we expect five lines and we see five lines at the right intensities. There's really no other structure that could account for the mass spec, the infrared, the UV, and the NMR, other than the cage structure of fullerenes. So it's a really beautiful set of measurements. Thank you very much for listening.